Hi, welcome to Economist. I'm Keith Halliday, your host. Our show is a chat show about Yukon business and economics, and uh, we've got three segments in each show. One on business and economics, and that segment, of course, is about business and economics. The second one is public policy, which is about rules and policies and how, our, how we govern ourselves here in the North. And the final segment is living the dream, which is something interesting about someone who's come here to the Yukon and uh, has found their own path in some way that's uh, interesting to share with the viewer. Our first guest today is Carlo Krozig. Carlo is the founder of Yukon Shine Distillery here in Whitehorse and a longtime Whitehorse resident. Carlo, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Well, Carlo, you and I went to high school together, and I was looking at the yearbook the other day, and I thought, you know, if we'd done one of those votes like they do at American high schools, who would be voted most likely to start their own distillery later in life? It, it probably would have been you. So let me ask you the question. Uh, are you living the dream? Is it, have you always wanted to have a distillery, and, and uh, are, you, know, are you, you living where you wanted to go right now? When I run into people and say, hey, what are you doing now? I said, well, I started a distillery. Like, you know what? That kind of fits exactly to a T. <laughs> Um, living the dream, I'd say that uh, it tends to flip back and forth between dream and nightmare. Um, a lot of times it's more on the nightmare side, the, the stress, the financial resources that uh, have just been shoveling into an empty pit. Uh, that's stressful and that's not so much of a dream. But uh, the other side of it, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty awesome business to be in. Uh, there's a lot of excitement in front and behind the scenes. Yeah, and it's very fulfilling. I was at your launch last year, and of course, here's some of the product right here, a beautiful bottle. Now, a lot of people joke when they're in the bar about starting a, a brewery or distillery, but you actually did it. What actually prompted you to act on the idea? Yeah, actually, uh, I contacted Yukon Liquor Corp after they had changed uh, a few of the, of the uh, antiquated liquor laws, and uh, I had thought about opening up a boutique beer, uh, import beer, import scotch, and import wine store, uh, much like you would see down, down south. They have a lot of little boutique wine shops. Um, I, I called uh, the Yukon Liquor Corp and asked them about that, and they said no. Uh, they said the only one that is allowed to, to sell alcohol are the uh, licensed uh, vendors, such as bars in, in the off sales um, themselves, and breweries or distilleries. And that's the first time I'd ever heard distilleries mentioned uh, in the Yukon. So that turned something and uh, whoever it was that I spoke to was, the, was really the, I have no idea, but that's the person who put it in my mind. And I got off the phone, started doing my research and found out that uh, micro distilleries are, are booming in North America, more so in the United States. Yeah. Um, and uh, are starting to now, five years later, starting to get that way in, in Canada. Now, of course, this is a business that traditionally has been totally dominated by the big boys. And when we say big boys, we mean really you know, giant global companies with billions and billions of revenues. So how do you find competing against them? What, what do you need to do to compete effectively against you know, a $10 billion multinational who's, yeah. uh, who's making, also making gin and vodka? Yeah, it's a good question. And uh, it's a very, very uh, important aspect in this business. I can't compete with these guys. So I can't go head to head with somebody who has a hundred million dollar marketing budget. I'm just not going to be able to compete. So what I, I need to do is I need to find a niche within that market that separates myself. Let's take Grey Goose for, for instance. Grey mm -hmm. Goose is one that everybody identifies with, upper echelon of uh, vodkas. The, the reality is they, they've done a tremendous, uh, tremendously great job at marketing their product. So when someone goes into a bar and they're trying to impress somebody, they're not going to order the cheapest vodka they're going to say. Give me a gray goose. Well, I don't want to be in that category. I don't want to be where somebody is saying, give me what everybody else is drinking, what everybody else is, their interpretation of this, look at me, I'm drinking this product. I want people to, to drink my product saying, I'm going to be different. I'm going to stand out by myself, looking at my product, tasting my product and saying, you know what, this is different. I like it and I don't care what everybody else is doing. So that's the market that I'm going to go after. The people who want to be their own man, let's say, yeah. um, and differentiate themselves from, from the, the, the crowds that are they're drinking the, the vastly popul popular at this stage, but vastly over-marketed products. Yeah, when I went, walk into the Whitehorse liquor store and I look at that wall on the, the north side of the building with all the spirits, uh, my eyes are actually drawn to this bottle. 
uh, your gin, the green one. Uh, it's a very striking bottle. How important uh, is it and, and what process did you go through to get a striking bottle to put your product in? Yeah, it's one of the things I, I, I knew I wouldn't have that huge marketing budget and I knew I'd need to, to, to differentiate my product from others. First thing that, you, that a, a consumer is going to do is they're going to see the products. There's a, over a thousand and it's growing every day of different uh, vodkas and less so in, in the gin category. But I needed to have something striking. So right away I, I wanted to go away from having a round bottle because there's a plethora of round bottles out there. So I went with square, tapered, uh, and then the design, I wanted it to be something that just caught people's attention. It, I, I went a little bit too far in the fact that the d design could not be replicated on a square bottle. I, I was told it was impossible and I consulted with, with experts all around the world that will still to this day say it's not possible. It took a year before the bottle manufacturers could figure out how to put that on the bottle. Uh, which it took a year out of my business, took a year out of my life, it took a year out of my savings, and, uh, but it, it needed to be something different, so I needed to invest that time and stick with it. Yeah, well, it's definitely worked. It draws my attention, like I was saying, at the store. Now, liquor, of course, is a highly regulated and also highly taxed business. I remember one, one guy joking with me once that if you spent a dollar on a beer, 60% uh, of that was taxes, 30% uh, you know, was marketing, and five cents was actually the beer. Um, you know, how, how of the $50 that someone spends in the liquor store, how much of that gets through to the, the people that actually made the vodka or the gin? Yeah, it's very little. Um, it's, uh, it's, every every uh, province uh, is different. BC and Ontario are the worst. Uh, Ontario is the largest purchaser of alcohol, so it's the sheer volume that you, you achieve by getting there. BC is one of the largest purchasers of alcohol uh, in the world as well. So. So even though you're making far less, you still need to get into those markets. But yeah, it's it's weighs heavily in favor of, of the government taxation. And if you look at the United States, you take it for instance, the last time I was in the United States, I looked at a bottle of wine that I buy here, it's 19.95 here, 7.95 in the United States. California wine, uh, I bought it in Maui, so I mean the transportation costs were probably the same as what it would cost to get that bottle here. Um, so it's a taxation. We have huge taxation here. Alberta has, has wised up and uh, they've privatized the alcohol industry in, in, uh, in their province and the taxes have been reduced. So selling in Alberta, actually I make twice as much money selling in Alberta than I do in any other province. Um, and it, it gets you to a point where you say, okay, you know, this is where I can make some money. Um, being able to get into the international markets as well is less taxed and yeah. more profitable. So uh, you're a serial entrepreneur. Ever since I've known you, you've been involved in business. You've owned a series of businesses. Uh, and business is also about taking risks and sometimes failing. So in this, uh, this distillery enterprise so far, what's your, what's your biggest failure to date and how did you get over it? Yeah, um, I'm, a, I'm a, I guess, a risk taker and a gambler. And that is probably to my detriment at times. I used to go to Vegas to gamble. I don't anymore. I just go to Vegas for entertainment. <laughs> Uh, and, and great restaurants. But uh, the biggest mistake I think I made was uh, doing this at a time that I just started a family. So I risked everything that I had and more on this business at a time that was probably the, the worst time to do this when I've got a, a family. I just I have twins coming yeah. up. My twins are as old as my, my business. Um, so that's been a really, really difficult thing. I, I read stories about how People that have, have made it incredibly, incredibly well uh, in this industry, but they've lived in their cars yeah. at, point, at points of time um, when they've had nothing. They've relied on their friends and relatives to, to get them from point A to point B. Uh, one guy made $85 million in sales last year, so he's, he's doing well, but he did live in his car for a period of time. Yeah. <laughs> I can't afford to, to live in a car with my family. No. So that was. I think I, I risked it at the wrong time. Let's wrap up uh, with a very quick game of buy, sell, and hold. And uh, so let me give you three products and then you say whether you would buy them if they were a stock in the stock market or sell them. Uh, the first one is buy, sell, or hold Russian vodka. Oh, sell, definitely. Yeah, Russian vodka is not uh, politically the place to be. Okay, buy, sell, and hold fruity vodka drinks in a can. Oh, yeah, definitely sell. <laughs> And then finally, buy, sell, or hold a bottle of gin or vodka as a Christmas gift for a colleague at work. Buy, 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 buy. <laughs>
I uh, thought you might say that. Yes. Carlo, thanks very much for coming in today. That was fantastic. Thank you, Keith. All right, and our next guest is Alice Sear on the Living the Dream segment of the of Economist. We have uh, Alice here. She's uh, born in Washington State, lived there for a while, lived also in Alaska, then in Tagish, and now is a resident of downtown Yukon, living the urban dream here in Whitehorse. Alice, welcome. Thank you. So what made you move to Canada after all those years in Alaska and, and the States? George W. Bush. <laughs> Tell me more about that. <laughs> I, came, I got up on the morning of November 4, 2004, and I came downstairs and asked Paul, do you think we could build something at the lake that we could live in year-round? And he said he thought so. So I went to the telephone book and ordered a new one from Whitehorse so I could call log builders. Yeah, and uh, I went to a Democrats abo Abroad a TV party on election night in 2004, and they said there were more, already more people, and after Bush won that election too, they were expecting more, more American immigrants. So have you met more people around the Yukon who, who came here for the same reason? Not really, not really. 2004 was the year that everybody said they were going to move, so now you can say you knew somebody who actually did. <laughs> And now, now that you've been here a few years, how do you compare living in the Yukon compared to living in Alaska? I'll never go back. Yeah, and why is that? I, there's something special about the Yukon. It, it's more relaxed. It's not so stuck on itself. It's, it's just a lot nicer, more civilized place than, than the states are. Now, for me as a longtime Yukoner, uh, liking to go, it's fun to go to Alaska, everything's a bit different there, mm -hmm. the beer's cheaper, everything seems louder, uh, but for you choosing a place to live, sort of the opposite is an attraction to you, is that, is that the way to think about it? Um, for Paul it was going home, and Paul really liked it. We lived in Bellingham in 2004, so um, this is quite a difference from Bellingham, yeah. and I was involved in a lot of historical things in Bellingham, and I liked it very much. But I was just absolutely delighted to come back to the north because for 30 years we'd lived in Skagway. And there's something, I mean, everybody who lives in the north will agree, there's something special about it. Now, Sarah Palin, of course, used to live in Skagway when you were there. And she has visited Whitehorse, as she said. She's even used our healthcare yeah. system, but she didn't stay around. Um, mm -hmm. But you have, you know, and how do you feel? Like, why do you think she went back and you stayed? Um, Went back from where? Well, she came, she was in Skagway, she came here and she went back to Alaska, and then we never saw her again. Oh, <laughs> well, when she came here, she only came up, as we all did on the train, to, to have medical attention. Yeah. And she was very young. I remember baby Sarah, probably four or five years old. Yeah. And she got, she got your cousin Tina's giveaway box. <laughs> when <laughs> Tina outgrew sweaters that I'd knit for her, baby Sarah got them. Yeah, well, she's not wearing them anymore. When we were in Juneau, we, we saw her, and I, I think she was still wearing all those clothes that the Republicans bought her during the election campaign. <laughs> Prob My, probably. But you know, when uh, Yukoners talk about Alaska, there's a certain fascination about it. And one of the things is about health care. And so when you lived in Skagway, how did you go to the doctor? How did you find it different than the service here, where there's doctors nearby, it's paid for by the government, and there's not as much risk? How, how was that different living in Alaska? Well, we rarely had a doctor in Skagway. Rarely. We did have a doctor there when Tina was born, but after that, having a doctor was very, very spotty. And if we needed a dentist, we came on the train to Whitehorse. It was very cheap up here, and everybody had a, a pass on the train because almost everybody worked for Way Pass. So um, it, was, it was an easy trip for Skagway people to make. Since then, they've gone to um, PAs, physician's assistants, yeah. and, and uh, they have had some just registered nurses stationed there who were very, very good. So often the question that I would get when I was living in, in, in Skagway was how can you do without health care? You know, isn't it just terrifying? Yeah. And I said no. It really isn't. It really isn't. You just you play the hand you've got, and and we live in Skagway, and we had a very bad accident in 1962, and uh, Richard was hit by a car, and we got the doctor from Haines, 17 miles away, out of the movie theater, and there in half an hour, 
and, and you couldn't do too much better than that in a big city. No, in fact, in a place like New York or yeah. Toronto, it might be with the traffic yeah. uh, much longer, in fact. So I never felt deprived by not having health care in, in Skagway, or health care available, I should say, in Skagway. I never felt deprived. I feel very fortunate to be here in Canada, and the longer I'm here, the more I appreciate the health care system because it's quite different than what they're trying to foist off in the United States. Yeah. You know, everybody pays into it, and everybody can then take out of it. Whereas in the United States, the best they could get through Congress was to have insurance companies as a middleman. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work. Yeah. Another thing that Yukoners are fascinated about with Alaska is the dividend fund. You know, we all sit here complaining in April about our income taxes mm -hmm. in Alaska. There's the check from the government, and the governor, whoever it is, always goes on the radio and opens the envelope and makes a big deal of it. Oh, yeah, they always act like it come out of personally their pocket. <laughs> uh, we were in Skagway when they started the permanent fund dividend, and it was um, sh very shortly after the oil money started coming in. And it was a portion of the profits went to every citizen in Alaska. And you have to be there uh, the major portion of the year. You can't be just a summer resident. And um, I was against it. I think we actually did get to vote on it. But I was against it because I thought it would better go to the community that a community could collectively take that money and Skagway could have a swimming pool and, right. and have the money to maintain it. But instead it went to individuals and mine went out of state. You know, I sent mine, bought stocks with it to right. an outside company. So, um, but it's still a very important thing. This year it's $900 and the checks will be coming out very soon. Yeah, when I was in Juneau last year, around the time the check came out, the ads were full of snowmobile and motorcycle and new truck ads on the radio, and I think the car dealerships were very yeah. excited. I think uh, Alaska Airlines, if, I may be wrong, but I think it is Alaska Airlines, that just give us your dividend check and we will give you a voucher for, you know, so many plane trips and that sort of thing. But it, it, for families who save the money, bank the money, by the time their babies are college age, they will have enough money to put them through college. Yeah, exactly. You know, they will. Now, as a fourth generation Yukoner myself, I was, I was fascinated to hear that when it was first discussed back in the day, the original plan that some of the state legislators put forward was that it, it be uh, scaled by the number of years you'd been in Alaska. So sourdoughs would get 25 or 50 yeah. times more money than Chichacos. But, but apparently that turned out to be unconstitutional. But, but what would you have thought of that? Um, I don't know, I'd have to think that one through, but originally they did do something like that and the old timers got a stipend based on the fact that they were, they had been in Alaska for a number of years. So they did start out with a spin-off on that, but then it's based on production and the price of oil, the money yeah. that comes to the state and is there then invested. And so it's down now and they had to stop the, the um, I can't remember what they called it, but it was the old timers, yeah. and they got a special fixed amount every year as well. Well, the Yukon has a new deal now with the federal government around uh, resource royalty taxes that'll come to the Yukon government, but we'll have to have a much bigger mining or oil and gas or something industry before the checks start to flow to the mm -hmm. Yukon government. And even then, it'll be to the government, not to Yukoners. To the but speaking of sourdoughs, of course, uh, you've lived in the North a long time, and your husband, Paul, you know, his father came over the Chilkoot Pass, and so just, you know, why don't we wrap up? You can tell me how you feel about being able to drop the bomb at dinner parties that your, your father-in-law walked over the Chilkoot during the gold rush. That well, must feel good. You know, I, I, I think I'm honored to be a part of the Sear family, to be a part of a pioneer family, and there are a great many still left in Whitehorse. But I have so often used that to illustrate the fact that the gold rush really didn't happen all that long ago. It's the just that life was lived so differently then. And, and I have very often used that in talks that my father-in-law came into the country over the Chilkoot in 1898. My father was, what, was 10 years old when the Wright brothers flew. <laughs> and the year he died, Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon. So I often used that as an illustration of just how fast the, the world is moving. 
Now, we, this is an economics show, so we always wrap up with a round of buy, sell, or hold. So I'm going to give you th three ideas or concepts, and you tell me if they were stocks in the stock market, would you buy them, would you sell them, or would you hold them? And the first one is, Alice, would you buy, sell, or hold Canadian Thanksgiving? Not quite as flashy as American Thanksgiving, <laughs> but Canadian Thanksgiving, buy, sell, or hold? I would hold it. So it's at least at a decent time of the year. <laughs> okay. Um, buy, sell, or hold. Canadian border guards, you've known a lot over the years. Um, but for the most part, I find them far more, far more civilized than Rambo. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a buy? <laughs> that's a buy. Okay, and finally, let's wrap up with living the urban dream in downtown Whitehorse in your condo compared to living in the forest out in the bush in Tagish or in Alaska. So living the urban dream in Whitehorse, buy, sell, or hold? Sell. So, oh, yeah? I will always miss Tagish. <laughs> Alice, always. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. All right. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. All right. Our next guest on Economist in the public policy and arts segment is Catherine McCallum from the Guildhall. Catherine was originally born in Sydney, Australia, uh, but unlike the other 23 million people in that country, had the good sense to move to the Yukon um, a number of years ago now. But yeah. uh, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Kate. Uh, the Guildhall is such a great institution in Whitehorse, I, I enjoy going to the shows every year. And uh, you know, this looks like you've got a great season coming up. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it, Freak Wins? Who would have guessed that insurance sales could become so much fun? I know, I know. Now we're having a ball with this show. It's, a, it's an Aussie thriller, horror, comedy. Yeah, I don't really know how that works, but it does. Uh, somehow the, the, the humor works with the scary bits, and, uh, and it's a fantastic show. So it's really, really, really fun and really disturbing. Yeah, well, I think the <laughs> theater about banks and insurance companies is underrated. I, I do a lot of work with banks and insurance companies professionally, and I, I went to the Puccini opera that has Wells Fargo agents singing in the chorus. So. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, I, I, I never really thought about it like that. It's, uh, it's just, but I guess you've got a point. But it's, uh, it's, it's just good, solid fun. And, uh, and the rest of the season's great, solid fun, too. We've got an Irish play coming up by Martin McDonough in November, uh, The Cripple of Inishman, yeah. which is going to be hilariously funny also and equally disturbing. Um, and then in uh, January, February, we have a lovely play by uh, Leanna Brody called The Book of Esther, and it's a Canadian-written play. And I believe that it's only been um, produced once or twice before, so it's another new one. And then, uh, and then in the spring, we have uh, Often I Find That I'm Naked, which is another quirky, not-so-laugh-out-loud funny comedy from Australia. So all mm. Commonwealth plays this year. Now, one of the interesting things about the Guild is that you have some great local talent. Uh, but then also you bring in experts and uh, talent from outside. And you've got Sarah Rogers coming shortly. Yeah. So tell us about her. How's she going to help out and, and what's her role and what is she going to help you do at the Guild? Uh, Sarah's actually been here for a couple of weeks already. We open next week on the 26th of September with Freak Wins and she's been directing the show. So what the Guild does every year is bring up professional directors from out of town. Sometimes they're from Vancouver, sometimes Toronto, uh, other places in Canada. We've also had directors come over from Birmingham in England and Adelaide, Australia and places like that. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, of funding and support for this because it allows our uh, local talent to get exposure to professionals from out of town. We've had a lot of our local talent uh, take their talent out of town as a result of this exposure too. So it's really, really awesome. And it also brings up our production levels to a really high, high standard. It's not your average community <laughs> theater at all. <laughs> no, no, it's really fantastic. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I went to Chicago. I took my daughter Pascal to Chicago last year and we just had a fantastic time. Such a and, great job. Uh, you know, um, I remember James McCullough was in that. And if you'd asked me, when I was back in high school, if I ever would have paid good money <laughs> to take my children to a show where James McCullough takes off his clothes, I, I think I would have thought you were crazy, but it, it worked very well. The whole cast was fantastic. Yeah, that was a great scene. It was a great scene. It always got a great chuckle from the audience. Yeah, yeah. Dogs. It's right up there with the Pride and Prejudice scene where Mr. Darcy comes out of the lake wearing the wet shirt. That's an awesome scene. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's one of my but this is, this is a business show, so let's talk about the Guild as a business sure. because it has revenue and costs. Mm -hmm. So for an organization, a community theater, how much of your money comes from ticket sales, versus fundraising, versus government grants, and so on? Uh, the government grants and the civic grants and, and all of the sort of, you know, the things that I apply for every year, and they make up about 50% of our revenue. Box office and bar are about 20%. Um, fundraising is about 10% and then rentals and other revenue is another 20%. So 
So the, the government stuff is about 50%, which is huge, and we can't live without it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, now, now, I'm interested to hear that 20% comes from rentals and other revenue generation, and uh, just 10% from fundraising. So mm -hmm. I know that in bigger cities where there are lots of millionaires and major multinational corporations, they often make very big gifts to the arts. But do you think fundraising, you know, given how tight government budgets are, are you going to have to do more of that in the future, do you think? We're trying, yeah. You know, I mean, we're maxed out on our government grants. We're maxed out with lotteries. We're maxed out with the city. We're <laughs> we're maxed. Um, so you know, th and that is a board board meeting uh, topic. Uh, every yeah. board meeting, you know, how are we going to fundraise? It is very difficult to fundraise in this town because there are so many not for profits. There's only how many people in the Yukon under thirty thousand. Yeah. So you know, everybody's going for the for the fundraising dollar, and it you know everybody loves the guild, and we do get a lot of fundraising dollars. But it's it's a real stretch, a very big stretch to try and get those dollars. In. Yeah. Now I know from talking to you previously you run a very lean operation up there but on the cost side you know what are your main expenses and, and what can you do to manage your costs? We are doing pretty much everything we can to manage our costs. Everything that we earn pretty much goes into production. It just does and, uh, and it, everything outside of that is just the leanest that we can be. Um, we use volunteers a lot to, to keep to keep the guild running. You know, without them, we're lost. Um, and I was I was thinking about this, and I figured out that per show we use about two thousand volunteer hours to get a show up and running. So per season, when we do four shows a season, we use eight thousand volunteer hours. And if we were paying those volunteers ten bucks an hour as a sort of a minimum wage, we'd be looking at uh, eighty thousand dollars a season. Yeah, I think that's so. one of the things when you look at the profit and loss statement of a nonprofit like yours and you see 50% of the money comes from the government, yeah. that's a uh, place that's not including all the volunteer hours. No. And I'm amazed at how many hours, that's a huge, huge. it really is a community theatre, it takes a community totally to put that does. kind of show Absolutely together. Absolutely does. Well, there's, there's no such thing as the Guild without the Guild community, it just doesn't work. Yeah. Now we ran into each other earlier this year when the City Council in Whitehorse proposed increasing property taxes on nonprofits because yeah. a nonprofit that I'm also involved in uh, was making the point to City Council that, that we thought that was a bad idea. But, but tell us, if, if your property taxes go from zero to whatever thousand dollars, you know, what, will, what impact will that have on the Guild? Uh, you know, if my property taxes, if our property taxes went up to, say, $1,500 a year, then that's a whole show that doesn't get a set. Yeah. Um, and if they go up to $10,000 a year, then that's a whole show that just gets cut. That's it. That's all. And, you know, to, to fundraise that extra $1,500 would take months of planning and uh, volunteer hours and guild board meetings and things like that just to get, you know, fundraising is difficult. To, to fundraise $1,000 is many, 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 many man hours to try and make that happen. So to take, you know, to, to ask us to spend $1,000 or $1,500 a year in another direction that's not mm -hmm. production, we're hooped. You know? I mean, one of the great things about the Guild is the number of productions it puts on, because there's always something interesting happening. And I guess one of the ways, if, if you were forced to save money, would be to have fewer productions, maybe that ran a bit longer, but that would mean, you know, more dark nights and fewer yeah. things to do out in Whitehorse. No, absolutely, absolutely. I think, it would, I think it would have a very negative impact on the, on the community to take a show away from them per year, for sure. Yep. Well, one way we always wrap up, because this is a business and economics show, is with a round of buy, sell, and hold. And this is where I'm going to say <laughs> a few things to you. And then, uh, you know, if you think that if they were a stock in the stock market, you would buy them, say buy, if you, or you sell them, or hold them if you're sort of neutral. Uh -huh. so, so the first thing to ask you about is uh, community theater in the age of Apple TV and YouTube and so many other things that we can do. Oh, buy. Buy, 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 buy. <laughs> and keep buying. Um, there, there's no, there's no, you can't live without theatre, you can't live without live performance, it's live storytelling, it feeds people's souls, it keeps people healthy. It's a healthy community that has a live theatre in it, so yeah, but. Okay, now this one, buy, sell or hold, going to the Yukon Arts Centre to watch on the big screen a uh, show from New York on Saturday morning. On Saturday morning? You know what they're doing up there, you can go and watch you know, Puccini or something from New York, but you watch it in Whitehorse on the big screen at the Arts Center. Um, compared to a, a live experience, is that a buy, sell, or hold idea? For me, it's a hold idea because I'm, I'm, I'm a junkie. I'm a live theater junkie. Uh, you know, but I, I still would definitely go um, if someone else bought. <laughs> But yeah, you know, I, I, I think it's worthwhile. I know a lot of people get a lot out of it, but for me, I'm, I'm, I'd just rather be live. I'd rather be there. All right, buy, sell, and hold this idea for increasing merchandise sales at the Guild, a t-shirt with a picture of James McCullough taking his shirt off in Chicago. Buy, sell, or hold that merchandising idea. 
I'm going to sell that merchandising <laughs> idea because I don't think James would go for it. <laughs> I think he'd sort of have my head on a plate. Okay, thank you very much for coming on our show. Thanks for having me. That wraps it up for Economist with Keith Halliday this week. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you.